Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to our webinar, webinar today about uh, your go-to guide on IRA. Uh, we'll give a few more minutes to, to see if more people join, uh, but we will, we will start shortly. Uh, in the meantime, just uh, remember that you can ask any questions you have through the chat box questions uh, you have here uh, in, in GoToWebinar. So yeah, just give us a few more minutes and we'll, we'll start right away. Okay, well, uh, welcome uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us here uh, today. Um, today we will be talking about uh, your go-to guide uh, on IRA or the Inflation Reduction Act. So what you US and foreign PV developers and EPC companies uh, need to know about, about this bill. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce the host, Well, Sharp, uh, if you wanna introduce yourself, welcome. Hi everybody, yeah, thanks Gabby. Uh, Thank you. I'm Sar Boskin. I'm uh, the VP of Commercial Product here at Inveris uh, and work with all of our teams in identifying what we need to go next with the product as well as in making sure that we're on top of the markets always and uh, looking at what people are interested in. Thank you, Sar. Very excited. And well, I'm uh, Gabriel Gavi uh, Cañada, Senior Account Executive here at Radio Power, uh, now, of course, part of, of Inveris. And yeah, I've been mostly focused on mostly focused on on sales uh, in the past, and now working on any, our integration. Uh, Rate of Power is based in Spain with with our our US team. So well, uh, thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, the webinar today will be uh, will last for 45 minutes. Uh, so we will leave some time at the end for for your questions. Uh, again, if you have any, please do drop them in our um, chat box uh, with, with all your questions and we will try to answer as many as possible during uh, the webinar. If not, we are not able to answer all of them. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you uh, by email. So what are we going to talk today about today? So first, uh, start with, we'll start with, with uh, an introduction on, on IRA. Uh, then we'll explain how Enverus uh, can help you take advantage of, of this bill. And then, as I explained earlier, we'll leave uh, around 15, 20 minutes at the end so, so you can ask uh, as many questions as you have. Uh, in this session, so during this webinar, uh, you will have the chance to, to understand what the IRA or Inflation Reaction Act is uh, and how it can impact your business. Uh, of course, learn about what opportunities, uh, not only opportunities, but also risks it poses uh, and how to na navigate uh, them as well as the re regulatory challenges that, that come with it. Uh, if you're a foreign company, uh, don't worry, we will explain as well how you can benefit uh, from this bill. And, and lastly, uh, as I said earlier, 
I will explain how we, uh, Inveris, uh, can help you take advantage of, of this bill. So, Sharp, the, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thanks, Gabby. Um, we can start off by talking about the IRA. So, um, if we go to the next slide here, uh, this will kind of give you a summary of of what we're going to talk about. But really, when 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 we think about the Inflation Reduction Act, this legislation is really groundbreaking in that it's it's expected to invest nearly $370 billion in energy security and climate programs over the next decade. However, it's it's worth noting that that $370 billion is just an estimate. The tax credits that the IRA affords are actually not capped, so it could be more. Uh, it's by far the largest climate investment in US history, and it's broadly positive for all things in the energy transition. The benefits of this towards the energy transition related technologies is, is through tax breaks that reduce the cost of renewable investment and development. The renewables are made more competitive through these tax breaks instead of imposing additional costs on traditional forms of, of energy generation. So it's different from something like a carbon tax in that regard. You'll to be able to take advantage of it, you, you will have to form or utilize an existing US-based affiliate. After all, these are tax credits against US tax obligations, but the bill does extend and expand tax credits and, uh, and, 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 and it reduces the ambiguity that existed before around if and when these tax credits would expire or phase out uh, as an offering. The extension of, of the credits uh, really allows for even more technologies to be able to claim tax credits where they weren't able to before. Uh, those include things like standalone storage projects and hydrogen, for example. So when, when we think about the ambiguity around tax credits, especially for wind and solar, that's, that's largely been lifted. Uh, in fact, that ambiguity around any generating facility with zero GHG emissions has been lifted. Uh, you will able to you'll be able to claim the production tax credit or the investment tax credit, and those will stay in effect at least until 2032. Eligibility may actually continue to, to, to be in effect past 2032. Uh, that's going to be based on GHG emissions in the United States from electricity if they don't fall by 75% by 2032, uh, that will continue to be at full rates until we reach 75% of GHG emissions from electricity based on the base of 2022 um, have been eliminated and then it will phase out. So uh, once the latter of 2032 or that 75% GHG emissions occurs, um, the second year will get 75% of the tax credits, the third year will get 50% and then expire thereafter. So remember that the, the eligibility only requires that the construction starts in that year. Once construction has started, even if that's in 2032, for example, the tax credits will be honored at that 2032 rate for that facility. So the production uh, uh, the production tax credit, for example, will run 10 years following commercial operations, even if you start construction 2032. Uh, with regards to the PTC and ITC, their rates have actually been increased from their previous phase out style rates. So the production tax credit base rate is now $5.20 per megawatt hour, but if wage and apprenticeship requirements are met, it's a full $26 per megawatt hour in 2023. This production tax credit is, uh, is adjusted annually for inflation. And you know, the, the PTC is, is production based, of course. It's going to be based on how much electricity you actually generate and sell. And it's paid for the 10 years following commercial operations. The investment tax credit, that, that's a one-time credit granted when the, the facility is placed in service. So that base rate 6%, and if the wage and apprenticeship requirements are met, 
it multiplies by five, just like the PTC to 30%. With regards to the to the wage and apprenticeship requirements that get you to these uh, to this $26 or 30%, to meet the wage requirement, the facility owner needs to ensure all workers and workers associated with contractors or subcontractors are paid wages at or above the Davis-Bacon prevailing rate. So that prevailing rate's available everywhere. You just have to be able to show that everybody associated with the facility for the duration of that credit uh, and, and, and when you qualify for it are all meeting that prevailing wage rate. To meet the apprenticeship requirement, the owner must ensure that qualified apprentices perform a certain minimum percentage of the total labor hours and that minimum is 10 percent if you your construction started before 2023 12 and a half percent in 2023 and 15 percent after 2023 now if there is a good faith effort made by the developer to find apprentices from a registered program but for some reason you can't and you can prove that you have acted in good faith that apprenticeship requirement may be considered as met as well so uh, it does allow you to make good faith effort and and fulfill that requirement if you can't in fact uh, get as many qualified apprentices as you had hoped to then above and beyond these these tax credits what the IRA has introduced, which are completely new, are these bonus uh, tax, uh, additive bonus tax credits. So there are several of these, so we'll, we'll go through them in order. And one of them is the, the domestic content bonus. The domestic content bonus is a 10%, and it's only actually 2% if you don't meet those wage and apprenticeship requirements. But if you meet those, it's a 10% bonus tax credit that is additive to either the ITC or the PTC. To meet the domestic content requirements, you need to fulfill two things. First of which is all steel and iron utilized must be produced in the United States. The second is that at least 40% of the cost of manufactured products that are not steel or iron that are used in the facility must be produced in the US. That 40% rate increases to 45 for projects going into construction in 2025, 50% in 2026, and 55% thereafter. So it is an increasing domestic content requirement. And it's worth noting that these percentages are slightly different. If you're looking at offshore wind projects, it's actually only 20% to start with in, uh, in 2023. Uh, for this manufactured products uh, piece. The guidance that's been released by the IRS and more and more guidance continues to come in since the IRA has come out almost a year ago now to really put more structure and, uh, and, and, and knowledge around how these credits will be realized and, and uh, and utilized and what, what requirements mean, need to be met to, uh, to, to qualify. So the guidance released around the domestic content rules uh, just recently show that it may in fact be a very limiting application of the initial IRA language, uh, particularly because of how the manufacturer's products piece is to be counted and accounted for. The steel and iron is a little straightforward uh, it's 100% of it, so um, that's simple to understand, but the manufactured products piece goes down to the component level. So um, that's that's going to be, that's going to create some risk around making sure that you can qualify and prove, if you get audited, that you are meeting that requirement in particular. Now, another additive bonus is the energy communities. Um, Energy communities are going to get an additional 10% bonus adder, and all of these can be stacked, so added, added on top of each other. So you can get 40, 50, 70% tax credits if you add all of these together, right? But the bonus percentage for, uh, for the energy communities is still 10%, another 10%. And there are three types of energy communities. One of those is brownfield sites. 
And the other one is the census tract or adjacent tract in which a coal mine closed after 1999 or a coal fire generation plant closed after 2009. Those are the two easy ones to understand because you can locate those facilities. There's a list of brownfield sites uh, that everybody has access to. Now, there's a third one, which is based on metro and non-metro statistical areas. And you have to meet two requirements there. One of them is that it has to have an unemployment rate at or above the national average. And post 20, 2009, it had to have at least 0.17% direct unemployment in or 25% tax benefits from traditional oil, gas, coal related businesses. So all the guidance has been released on all of these layers now. And uh, these are geographical extents, which can now be viewed within our platforms, for example, to, to make sure that you can qualify for that additional tax credit and you realize and understand where you can build projects to take advantage of this additional tax credit. Now, there's also a, a 10 to 20 percent adder for what's called the environmental justice allocation in low income uh, communities. But this is for smaller projects of less than five megawatts. And uh, this is actually an allocation. Unlike all of the other tax credits that we talked about, there's a cap of 1,800 megawatts that will be available each year to these kinds of projects. So it is uh, on a first come first serve basis in terms of being able to get these particular credits. Again, it applies for these smaller projects and it's greater uh, towards the 20% side if you can actually prove that it's it's impacting low income households and uh, the, the allocation of the benefits are split between the folks that live there and the developers. So the well, one of the risks around all of these tax credits is that the developer has to be able to prove to the IRS that these requirements are actually met. So they become liable in a way for qualifying any of these credits. Uh, what that's going to mean is that there will likely be some developers that are going to request that these EPCs, O&M companies will provide the documentation and guarantees around things like the domestic content utilized or, uh, or, or especially the wage and apprenticeship requirements are met. So in, in, in some cases, we can even start to see that there might be an insurance market that starts forming around these particular requirements and meeting those requirements. Now, let's talk about a few other things about the IRA that, that are important and create some opportunities as well as, uh, as, as risks again. One is that solar projects can now choose the PTC in lieu of the ITC. So previously, solar used to only be eligible for the investment tax credits. Now they can actually choose to utilize the PTC instead of the ITC. What that means is that usually projects that have a high capacity factor and a low or average cost project cost, those would likely be good candidates to take this offer because it, it, it would generate more tax credits for them. Additionally, the, the, the tax credits have now become transferable for cash. In the past, these credits could only be monetized through tax equity partnerships, uh, especially if the entity itself did not have a tax base to offset. That's often the case for the special purpose entities that are created for these projects. So tax equity it has been an integral part of the capital stack. And the, the tax equity will continue to be, uh, to be ever prevalent, particularly it's gonna be the blue chip way in a way to, to, to monetize these tax credits as it helps to also monetize the depreciation piece of the tax benefits as well. 
However, tax equity markets will now be flooded with even more tax credits. Remember that we increased the tax credits and we've added new tax credits for other, uh, other parts of the energy evolution. So currently this, this tax equity market is a $20 billion market annually. Bank of America and JP Morgan account for about 50% of the deals that are done in this space. That market will continue to grow, but the abundance of these tax credits mean that the discounts are likely going to be higher. And those developers who don't have access to tax equity markets due to, let's say, the lack of availability of that $20 billion allocated or, or whatever it grows to, or reputation within the market, uh, may have to make do with the transferability side of the equation that's now been introduced. The transferability market is going to be a completely new market. So there's going to be a lot of risk inherent, especially as there is some, um, let's say, precedent formed around how they will work. Um, at the moment, although there's still more guidance being awaited, the market has garnered a lot of interest. And what we're seeing is that a lot of these deals uh, on platforms like reunions and others are being priced at, you know, the 90 to 92 cents on the dollar range. Uh, and there are creative and structured uses of transferability that may lead to a robust creation of a market. Um, so even folks that participate in tax equity markets uh, may may continue to, to to also play in that transferability market because of some of the flexibility it allows in relation to a traditional tax equity deal. Also, folks who haven't participated in tax equity markets uh, may find that these transferability uh, style deals may be more palatable in size, so um, that that may increase some of the the, the appetite for uh, for tax credits to be monetized through this um, this particular way. Uh, also, tax equity partnerships may still utilize it as uh, a, as a way to you know take some of those benefits, but also dilute some of the risk by selling some of those credits. So. All this remains to be seen. Guidance is still coming out about it, but it's a, it's another market that's been created for the purposes of being able to monetize these tax credits. As you know, mentioned before, also the, the the hydrogen and standalone storage projects are now eligible for tax credits, and there are incentives that have been put in place by the Inflation Reduction Act for advanced manufacturing or mining of nearly anything associated with the energy evolution. So the hope here is that this will increase the adoption of US manufacturing, but the cost of minerals mined here and the manufacturing costs may still be a problem in relation to these domestic content rules and things like that. So um, we'll, we'll continue to monitor the growth of U.S. produced and U.S. manufactured goods that help and expand the energy transition, uh, but there are things in place to incentivize this to move along at a quicker pace now. And we have seen a lot of announcements about factories being moved here, manufacturing being moved here, people looking at new mining opportunities, et cetera, since the IRA has come around. Now, there are a couple other things that we've listed on this slide. So carbon capture technologies, the 45Q credit has been extended and expanded. There's tax credits for EVs that have been extended. And there's also been a uh, production tax credit introduced for nuclear facilities that are already in service to kind of keep them going for longer uh, to create that additional baseload. Uh, those are all things that will continue to create actual additional tax credits that the market will have to find a way to deal with. So when we think about what the Inflation Reduction Act really does, if we can go to the next slide here, Gabby, considering what the, the implications are for economics of projects, it becomes very easy to see that it, it will continue to drive a lot of investment in 
zero GHG emission generation. So when we look at how the IRA drives some levelized cost of electricity declines, on the right-hand side, for example, you see the solar after-tax levelized cost of electricity is going to be down as much as 30%. When you, when, when you pair that with all the cost declines that we've been able to see over the years, despite some of the cost increases that we've seen lately because of the supply chain issues and things like that, solar has become extremely competitive in every market in the United States. So the way to read this chart is that the, those black lines are solar weighted or wind weighted average prices in those markets and each one of those colored bars show sort of the after tax levelized cost of electricity after the tax credits are accounted for so if you have that ability to take the ptc for example in high uh capacity factor areas you'll see that your ptc uh will get you down to lcoe's that are well below $20 per megawatt hour, which is great pricing, of course, and much lower than the price that we see out in the market, the merchant prices. So this will continue to uh, to, 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 to drive renewable investments uh, and will continue to see uh, growth in zero GHG emission style projects. Now, what this also means is there will be a rush of even more projects entering the queue. And that'll include, include storage projects. So um, next slide, Gabi, we can um, kind of talk about storage as well. Here, the when we afford standalone storage opportunities, these tax credits as well, arbitrage opportunities become economic in almost all markets in some form, some, some markets more than others. but the green line is showing you sort of the price at which the uh, average min max daily LMP spread becomes economic for storage projects. And there is more variability above that in every single market that can be taken advantage of via storage. So all of this put together means that we're going to see a lot of investment in these sorts of projects. And all of these projects are going to enter ISO queues and utility queues. That means that there's going to be a lot of competitive projects out there. So one of the risks is actually the queue times that are going to, that are already pretty robust and pretty long. They might get even longer and there'll be a lot more competing projects. So being able to understand the general uh, consensus around where projects are, uh, where competitor projects may be that are competing with, you know, available transmission capacities in areas is, is very important to know. The other risk that is often not stated because it's not in the Inflation Reduction Act anywhere is grid risk. The Inflation Reduction Act does not make any money available towards grid upgrades. So what this really means is that we're going to be adding a lot more of this variable generation to a grid that is growingly fragile, uh, meaning that some of the risk will come from the upgrade costs that these ISOs or utilities may want to interconnect more and more renewable generation and storage projects. So overall, the Inflation Reduction Act is incredible for driving investment in and lowering the cost of renewables, making them more competitive with traditional sources of energy, and we'll continue to see the penetration of these renewable technologies into our generation stack. Uh, but some of the risks there are things to consider and navigate through in terms of making sure all of your accounting practices are, are in place for you to be able to prove these qualification requirements, especially for some of the more nuanced sort of tax credit adders and also in the risk of making sure you cite your projects in areas where you have a greater chance of being able to actually make it through the queue so your speed and efficiency with which you do that is going to be key for realizing the value of the IRA. 
So I'm going to pass it back to you, Gabby, for uh, for kind of an overview of how we may be able to help. Yeah, so you've you've already run through some of those points. Uh, we, we are running out of time, so I'll treat. I try to be. Uh, I'll try to be efficient here and and fast. So yes, yeah, as, as Sarp uh, was saying, there are many opportunities as as well as risks that come along with the IRA. So to to be able to take advantage of of these opportunities and and minimize, of course, these risks, uh, Enveris, uh, which now of course includes serrated power, as I mentioned earlier, uh, offers uh, energy developers, CPC firms. Uh, both locally and, and international, uh, a suite of products that, that will help them navigate the current environment uh, created by the IRA and, of course, uh, take advantage of, 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 of these benefits. So we're starting with, with the origination or, or project siting. Uh, we have a product called Prism, uh, which allows uh, developers to identify the best location to develop their renewable energy assets. So users can not only easily check uh, their current competition uh, in a specific area by looking at any, any operational asset um, that it's uh, operating there, but also can foresee the future competition by understanding the, the interconnection queues and the projects that, uh, the, the progress of, of the different projects that are, that are in development uh, in that near, nearby POI that they might be interested in. Uh, in addition, uh, users of, of this tool can also, as, as um, Sharp was mentioning earlier, identify or, or locate transmission lines, uh, substations, and suitable parcels um, to, while considering these uh, disincentive areas uh, known as energy communities, to understand which is their best location for, for their projects. Uh, Additionally, for, for a seamless process, uh, after selecting the, the appropriate, appropriate site or, or parcel uh, in PRISM, they can easily export this into, into PV Design, uh, our other tool, to carry out the, the design and engineering uh, of this PV plant. Uh, so PV Design uh, will help them figure out what is their best configuration uh, for, for the PV project uh, by rapidly trying so different equipment, module, inverter, racking system, uh, try different electrical civil configuration to understand in the end which is the best combination uh, that will yield uh, the most energy and, and minimize the, the capex or, or cost of, of the project. Uh, on, to, on top of that, uh, also uh, the software will help uh, analyze the, the design engineering of, of the substation connected to that PV project, of any battery storage project uh, that you would like to connect as well, and of that Gentile line uh, as well, connecting your, your project substation to your point uh, of interconnection. And this will all be in, in one, one only tool. Uh, so in PV design for every iteration that is generated within, uh, within the software, um, the software will, will generate a package of engineering documentation, uh, that will include a layout, bill of quantities, uh, single line diagrams, energy yield estimations, and many more documents that will be useful for many different purposes, uh, feasibility analysis, interconnection applications, investors and landowners relationships, or, or even pro project cost estimation. So in the end, why, why, why will this tool uh, help you take benefit of, of this IRA? So due to the competitive landscape uh, that we are seeing uh, now, and that's only going to increase uh, as, as IRA uh, comes in place, um, there, these tools like PRISM or PV Design will accelerate that early uh, stage project development phases, allowing you to screen uh, e, what, what, which are the, the best areas for building your, your project while taking the most advantage of, of the benefits of, of the IRA and, and knowing where you might be more or, or less successful. Uh, this will allow, of course, uh, developers to bring projects uh, or potential projects to fruition faster and more efficiently, uh, and it will also increase their chances of, of that project being successful and not getting stuck in, in that interconnection uh, queue by, by understanding what is the best uh, location for that project and then doing all that process uh, more, more efficiently and, and with more accuracy. So uh, this was all uh, from my side. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, we have a few minutes for, for some questions here. So I've seen already yeah. some in the chat box. I don't know, uh, Sarp, if you have already yeah. some. Yeah, yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll kind of get kicked off from the, from the top here. Uh, yes, this, this webinar recording will be made available. So you will have access to be able to uh, to to, to rewatch this uh, this webinar, so that was uh, one of the questions that we'll we'll answer right off the bat. Second, there's a the, the, there are questions around the, uh, the 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 new investment tax credit for 2025 onwards. 
So that's really an extension of the PTC and ITC tax credits for wind and solar to all other technologies. And it starts in 2025 and goes out to at least 2032 and then may fall off depending on the latter of either 2032 or when GHG emissions have fallen by 75% for U.S. electricity generation from the GHG emissions from U.S. electricity generation in 2022. So uh, that, that fall off will start at the latter of those two. So in effect, the credit that starts in 2025 is guaranteed through 2032, but it could last longer, as we mentioned. So uh, that's, that's going to be afforded the same PTC slash ITC uh, that, 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 that you would be used to. Uh, additionally, there's a question around energy communities and, 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 and what falls into it and what doesn't. So the IRS did release guidance around that. And we have been able to map all of the areas that fall into this, uh, into this category. It is a broad category, but it, it is very much nuanced in terms of being able to get to the to, to, to the correct locations. So the IRS with their metro and, and, and non-metro statistical areas, uh, you have to make sure that you're keeping very close track of those numbers and they, they will change year to year. So that's going to be a broad, the, the broadest, I would say, uh, qualification, but still there's, there, there will be large swaths of the country that still don't qualify for that particular credit. So uh, take a look at uh, layers like ours and PRISM to be able to, to identify where those sit and, um, and, and, and you can make sure that you qualify for those by making sure you're, you're following along with the IRS's uh, yearly definitions of those communities as well as additional brownfields added, et cetera. There's a question around the expected, with, with the expected increase in renewable projects, is there concern for the saturation of transmission and distribution infrastructure? Absolutely. There's a huge concern about available transmission capacity and distribution capacity for the addition of more and more renewable assets. Now, what's the main cause of this is is because a lot of projects get cited for further away than where demand really is so we count on interfaces to take these this electricity to where demand is and that infrastructure is often runs into congestion uh, issues and they have to be cognizant of that fact because congestion can mean that although you have an asset the sun's shining or the wind's blowing, if you don't have the transmission capacity to send it anywhere, that asset will actually be curtailed and your pricing will be, will have a large basis risk to it. So you have to be very, very cognizant of where you're building the project and congestion on the lines, as well as the available transmission capacity for future projects and how that's going to impact congestion across the, the grid as it is today and the grid as it'll look in a year to five years from now. So we do have tools in our toolbox that allow us to understand what, uh, what, what's flowing across all the lines, understand sort of what additional uh, injection capacity is at different substations, et cetera, so that you can avoid that pitfall of transmission and distribution risk. Transmission and distribution will continue to see some investment in it but this investment will largely have to be made by transmission service providers. And as I mentioned, that kind of infrastructure is a lot harder to move along because they don't have the same incentives. And there's a lot of not in my backyard style opposition against new transmission lines and distribution lines put up across the network. So yes, it's a, it's a huge concern for sure. Um, we have a question around, does a company have to choose between PTC or ITC? You do, yeah, you cannot double dip. You have to choose one or the other. So it's either, uh, it's the PTC in lieu of the ITC, for example, for solar projects now. 
in the past, solar projects only apply for the ITC. Now they can apply for the PTC. Solar plus storage is a little bit different because solar uh, storage projects have ITC. They'll have to take ITC for solar plus storage style project. So those are the questions that we have. Oh, okay. One around uh, how does the domestic content rules get calculated? Okay, so the 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 domestic content applies for two different in, in two different phases. So the first is all steel and iron utilized in the project must be produced in the United States. That one is one of the requirements that has to be met. And then the percentage of cost of manufactured products used in that facility must be above 40% and that increases year by year. Now that manufactured products piece, that's pretty much anything that's not construction materials. So the IRS talks about construction materials as, you know, the steel and iron, right? The, the the racking system, piles, rebar, steel towers, right? Everything that fall, everything else outside of that falls into sort of this manufactured products, good product category. And to meet that requirement, um, it's it's going to be down to the component level. The IRS actually gave an example where uh, there were two manufactured products used uh, to simplify sort of the the example and the manufactured product number one is is a product that's built in a u.s factory uh, and has two components uh, and both of those components are manufactured in the uh, united states so the the total direct cost the direct cost includes wages for labor right is a hundred dollars Component 1A costs 30 bucks, component 1B costs 45 bucks, and the remaining $25 for was for wages and payroll taxes, right? Well, you can count everything as United Product, uh, United States manufactured, $100 of it, because all of the products included and the wage and labor were all United States. Now, manufactured product two, it's in a United States factory, it has three components and components, let's say 2A and 2B are United States manufactured, but 2C is manufactured outside of the United States. Then that means that the cost of component 2C and the wages and payroll do not count towards domestic content. So it's only the value of the 2A and 2B that was manufactured in the United States that can be utilized towards fulfilling the domestic content credit. So um, it is it is very limiting in that fashion. And it's more than likely that a lot of these manufacturers will have to qualify it themselves and keep track of this themselves. And probably because they have to do that, manufacturers that can help get to that domestic content requirement will demand a premium as, as, as they're going to be at risk for any IRS audit or anything like that that may occur. Uh, we have one more pod, uh, question here about if you put solar on site for offsetting that load, can you avoid connection to grid? Uh, yes, yeah, you can do off-grid. Uh, absolutely, you can do off-grid uh, offsetting load for sure. There's no, um, yeah, uh, on or off-grid, um, you can utilize this. Functionality. Yeah, I think that's that's all. We are on, on our last minute. So, well, thank you, Sar, very much for for joining thank us here uh, in this webinar. Of course, thank you everyone uh, for attending the webinar. Uh, if you have any additional uh, questions, please do reach us uh, uh, through our different websites. We'll be happy to answer those. I think there might be a few that we didn't answer, so we'll get back to you uh, by email. So again, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, we hope you can all start taking advantage of the IRA uh, and that uh, we can make uh, this industry uh, bigger uh, and, and grow renewables uh, around the US. So thank you. So